Welcome to Purpose or Delusion. I am your host, Brendan Forey. This podcast is designed to spark thoughtful conversations with people who are actively working in the entertainment industry. The following guest is an example of a creative, self-sufficient problem solver who is obsessively devoted to their craft. Oh boy, Danny, this next hour is going to be interesting. (laughs) You've doomed yourself. (laughs) Welcome to Purpose or Delusion. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm glad to be here and be talking. I'm, gl- I'm glad to hear you talking. This is Danny Irizarry. He's not only a close friend, but also my roommate. And um, So a very close friend. So a very close... Okay. Now we're very close. Let's keep the touching to a minimum. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's sorry, why we have this whole extra middle cushion right sorry, here. Sorry. This podcast, I've done... Uh, the two other episodes I've done have been very real because they're people ooh, we are clipping a smidge i'm gonna turn this down a bit okay um the two other episodes i've done have been real because i know the people but like we know each other yeah i you 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 and eric are probably the people like the two people i know the most about in california i'd also like to point out that um danny also designed the graphic for the show, Purpose yeah. or Delusion. Well, and a lot of that was taking... You You had a graphic that you designed, and uh, I think your first guest, Leah, had... Um, yes, Leah had, had some um, inspiration on it. And so it was just kind of putting those two together, and I sat in a coffee shop for a while and just had fun doing it, so it wasn't like wasn't like I was slaving over it for forever. Well, it's beautiful. Thank you. And you're beautiful. I appreciate it. Let's go to the beginning. A very good place to start. Um, how... Oh, first of all, before we do that... What do you do? You do so much. Um, uh, well, I think it, like a lot of artists, a lot of people in California who have come to be in the industry, I just, I have, I'm a jack of all trades and certainly a master of none. Um, I, I came out here specifically to pursue a career in acting, but I grew up, I had uh, two other friends um, who really loved filmmaking um, who are still still back in Chicago? I moved out from Chicago uh, just about two years ago. Which how long how long have you been in a, in California? Um, just over two years. Two years. So we're 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 reaching that benchmark together. Yeah. Um, okay. So if it, let's yeah let's go way back then. How did you get started? Oh, well, it all started when I was born. Yes, um, that's where it starts for most of us. <laughs> for most people. Well, maybe nine months before I was born. Anyhow, that's a different <laughs> <situation>. <laughs> Um But um, I, uh, I was always a theatrical person. I'm, I, I'm an extrovert, although I'm actually starting to question that now. Okay. Um, but growing up, I was the only extrovert in my family. All my, my mom, my dad, my sister are all, are all introverts and all very intellectual people. Um, and I hope that some of that rubbed off on me, the intellectual part. Um, but, um, I just always enjoyed having an audience. Um, Mm. and I learned the phrase Shakespeare, uh, uh, Shakespeare's phrase, uh, all the world's a stage when I was young and I embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, and then my, my very first step into, into, uh, the world of cinema was after I had been doing theater and, and, you know, I did church skits and, and, and was part of a community theater for a while. But, um, I used to work at a camp and a friend of ours was a film major at Biola out here. And, uh, she, she just walked up to me one day. I was like, Danny, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. I know you like to act. Uh, and I have this short film that I have to make for, um, for school. Would you like to be in it? And, um, you can actually find it on my YouTube channel. Um, I did it when I was probably 10 or 11. Wow. Um, yeah. And um, it was a short film called Moved by Love and actually won a couple of awards. Wow. And after after doing that, we just took a day and we just did it. Like, there was no pre-production. Mm-hmm. She just had a DSLR and we ran around camp and filmed it. it. And she had a story idea and we just did it. Um, and I loved it. I loved it so much. And I, I that was that was the moment that I knew that I wanted to be part of the cinematic world. Okay. Um, you, you didn't necessarily know in what regard at that point. Right. You're Ten years old and you knew I want to create. Right. I want to this. be an artist. And okay. I would. I I drew and I painted and I did all these other things as a kid. But I didn't really consider any. I didn't know what I wanted to. I also didn't really understand the concept of a job when I was a kid. When I was younger. Right. Um, I mean, you're ten. Right. Well, when I was when I was younger, I remember I, there's a story that is, uh, goes around in my family. I declared to my mom at one point that uh, as as a profession, I wanted to be the color blue. 
I don't know what that meant. But how, how is that going so far? <laughs> I'd say I'm uh, not not too unsuccessfully. I mean, look. Uh, you got the. I mean, maybe I am your offspring of career. Yeah, maybe and, that's how it's working. But um, I. Oh, I, for the I podcast, knew... but for the video, it, that makes sense. Oh yeah, we're uh, I'm, I'm, we're both wearing blue. I have blue on my socks, even, which is very. And I squid. have octopus, octopus socks. Octopus. Yep, I'm very I'm very excited about these. And well, the other sock is also blue. It's pineapples. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, I went and put these on for the podcast. Is there, so it's perfect. I'm choice. glad that I have. It's a perfect yeah, choice. A great, great transition into. <laughs> so you, you tell me about your. Let's go even back before you're ten. How did we get to ten years old? Your school life, your home life. What was that like? You said were, was anyone in your family artistic? My dad is actually an excellent artist. He draws very well, and okay. my mom is also artistic. She she paints, um, like, thank you, greeting... She paints greeting cards now. Mm -hmm. um, and she crochets, and she does a lot of physical artwork. Um, and actually, now, as I think back, a lot of my family is very artistic. Uh, my I think my uh, Uncle David and my Aunt Nina draw well. Um, and uh, they're all... Most of my family is very musical. My dad is very rhythmic. My... Um, my mom is is also musical. She plays the piano and sings mm -hmm. very well. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of that traditional art in my family, and it's always been appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, I remember even my grandfather's my grand my my grandpa Joe loved photography. My dad does photography. Okay. Um, my grandfather on my mom's side always had there was always paintings and and drawings and pictures on the walls at at their house, and I remember being very inspired by that. Hmm. And actually, I, oh wow! Now that I think about it, I had um, we used to build my my mom's father and I used to build uh, model ships together. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah, we have tea. <laughs> um, we used to build model Viking ships. I used to be obsessed with Vikings for a little while. I no, really? I no, I wanted to be obsessed with Vikings. I didn't. But you didn't I wasn't, actually I, push I, yourself I, far enough to be. Obsessed. I wasn't invested enough to be obsessed with Vikings, but I wanted to be. Hmm. Learning well, new things about me that you still you didn't know. Bro, about well, me. That's the mm -hmm. thing I love about this this whole podcast idea is because like, I ask questions I wouldn't actually ask necessarily in normal conversation and dig deeper than, than the usual like, you know what I know about you now. Right. Understanding what you were like from the time you were you know a baby to now is a whole different story and like. It actually is very on brand and actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there might be a lot of oh, comes the dawn moments. Yeah. But so you know, I was born in Ecuador. Um, yes, you were born in Ecuador. My, yeah. So most Why? of my earliest memories, my parents were missionaries um, okay. for seven years out there actually. So I was born third year, um, and my very earliest memory is um, it's just a, like a snapshot in my head of our backyard. I remember I can look out over 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 our backyard. Uh, we had guinea pigs. I remember seeing planter boxes, and there's a brick wall, and there's a cat sitting on top of it, and we have our bunnies How old over on you? the other side. I, I'm guessing probably three or four. Okay. Um, because I mean it had to be before five years old. Yeah. Um, because that's around when we were coming back to the United States. Um, and we had we had some friends uh, out out there, but I most most the most vivid thing I remember is that snapshot. Of wow. our backyard and me trying to light a match on my own when I was pre four years old and burning my finger in part of my hair. That sounds very damn. Yeah. Well, I had a bowl cut too, so I had like a. a, a you were a, on a mission. Oh yeah. Well, I had a divot out of my bangs in front uh -huh. of my head. I remember. I remember. Uh, maybe but me. I don't remember. Maybe I just remember pictures of it. But I know that I did have like a missing chunk in the front of my hair for a portion of my life. I looked like an acorn That's though. Right. That kid. smell is very specific. It, it is. It's nostalgic to me. I don't know. Why? Also, like, it if is. eggs burn, like if you have just a piece of egg that's burning, it'll smell very similar. Interesting. I don't know why. Maybe fun facts. Protein. Yeah. yeah. Protein. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna pretend to know. Um, so you were also homeschooled, correct? Yes. Uh, so all your life. Yeah, all of my life. I went to college for a little bit uh, at a community college before I came out here, but not. I didn't finish college. Mm -hmm. um, so most of all, all all of my completed academic uh, endeavors are. Uh, homeschooled yeah <laughs> what was that like and that was all in chicago yes all all back um I, That's where you I mean up. my parents started teaching me in in um ecuador but i don't remember any of them right. or anything like that um, so you moved to chicago from ecuador yes uh and once we found a place to stay for a bit we moved around a little bit but um 
I, that just the way that life was for me. I don't ever yeah. remember having a discussion about, hmm, there was, when I was going to high school, we talked about maybe going to, maybe going to high school, but that never really happened. Um, but the biggest question that I often get with that is like, how do you get social interaction? Um, I would hope that I'm not too bad. I'm not, I'm not socially, uh, like, uncomfortable to be around. I'm so but, uncomfortable Yeah, right yeah. No, that's how man rats. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's... No, you're a very charismatic and very outgoing and very intellectually sound person in Thank having... You. L- conversations of longevity, like... And that's something that I enjoy. I just like having yeah. conversations. And I wonder if part of that comes from being, you know, seeking that out as a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, I, I did I did gymnastics for a long time. I, I taught Taekwondo for a while. I um, I would do volleyball, and I was in a choir, and I did theater, obviously. So I didn't have a... I wasn't lacking friends. You weren't locked in a house. Oh, yeah. You know, with your mom and, and siblings? Yeah, have, one sister. One sister. Um, and, and that's not to say that there aren't... That it... It is sometimes a problem. I do yeah. know people who were who were unschooled, if you were, you know, yeah. just if you will, um, who are just kept in the house. And yeah, you can study whatever you want. They don't want to study anything, so they just don't learn, and yeah. they become antisocial. And that that is something that people should be that's aware a, of, but often thing. doesn't happen. Yeah, fair. I I grew up in for the first portion of my life was homeschooled, and throughout different portions of my life was homeschooled for different uh, times. Um, and was isolated at times, but there was so much else going on outside of school. Like for someone who goes to school, I feel like that is your life. For people who are homeschooled, when you're homeschooled, it's kind of like you're just at home, and then there's life outside of that. And so it's school isn't your life. It's I like would just agree. something you have to do, and then life is everywhere else. Agreed. But if you're going to school and you take up that travel time, and then the after school time, and all of that, it's like. That's it. School is life. I think that's an interesting point that I've never really thought of before, where, you know, as I have a day job now, part of my life is, you know, this is the chunk of the day. I go for nine, mm-hmm. you know, I go eight and a half hours of the day in a building where I do work, and yeah. then I leave, and then I have the rest of my life. That's a new concept for you. Yeah. In that the, regard, then. Yeah, exactly. That's a new concept for me, but also the idea that learning for me instead of being something I go and do, is just a part of life. Mm. So whenever, you know, I, I'm not in college now, but I'm still learning because I'm used to just living life and learning by living from life. Experience. Learning from experience. And that's something that I never really considered, how it could be segmented in someone else's mind. It could be, you know, set, set apart. Right. I go here to learn, and mm-hmm. then... And now I don't have to yeah. learn anymore. Yeah, and that's something I'm very excited and passionate about, and... A lot of people know how to memorize patterns and learn specific things to help them pass tests, but not a lot of people are taught to actually learn. Right. Yeah, because again, uh, the American school Themselves. system often teaches, I don't know about um, in other countries, but in America we're frequently taught to study for the test, you know the questions that are going to be on the test, you mm-hmm. learn the answers, you memorize the answers for a week. And then once you take the test, you forget it. And I, I mean, I would do that myself too, because I did, I was part of a homeschool group where there were a number of other homeschoolers who would come together and learn from them, from the people who knew best about each subject. Um, I learned science from, um, so from a very smart, uh, woman who was a nurse and is, I think she is a doctor now. Um, and, and very smart, loves science, mm-hmm. loves math, is very smart. I learned writing from a published author, you know, who wrote for, you know, people who papers. are doing it in the real world. Exactly. That's and so, so cool. and so it wasn't just, it, it wasn't just learning from, you know, my parents reading from a book yeah. or, you know, me reading from a book. There was a lot of real world, world experience. Um, but the nice thing about that was then I was able to, you know, later on in life when I had an agent and a manager and all that, I, I was able to, if I needed to run off and do an audition in the middle of the day and, then do my mm. schoolwork at night, or while I was at the audition, I could just sit there and do my math homework, which was interesting because sometimes that's like that calms your nerve because you're you're in an audition room, and you're not you're freaking out. Yeah, you're not freaking out about every. You're just like oh, and it just yeah. it takes your mind off of what you what um, might be stressing you out. Yeah, that's cool. So you're very a very self sufficient person in your education in your work. In, I mean, the fact that you moved to Los Angeles at 19, 18 years old? 18, yeah. 18 well, I, old. And I ho- always hope to be more self-sufficient because I'm still, I'm still figuring it out. But um, 
I enjoy the learning process that I've had. And as stressful as it has been. Yeah. How um, you got involved in acting at 10, kind of, was yeah. when you were like, ooh, I want to do this. When did you get your first manager, agent, and where? So, yeah, so that's something that I, I really love to talk about because um, it's hard to do. It's yeah. really hard to get an agent or manager, or it seems like a really daunting task. Um, and it used to be that you had to mail your headshot and resume out to, you know, you had to get, you had to collect the addresses of all these people, you had to collect yeah. the names, and then go to, you know, go to the post office and mail it out. Um, and that's, I mean, you can still do that, but it's not really what you're supposed to do anymore. Um, I got my, my agent in Chicago through a program called AMTC, um, which stands for Actors, Models, and Talent for Christ, um, which was a really cool program. Um, it was people of faith who wanted to be, to share their, their passion for creativity and art, um, but didn't know what they were doing. Um, yeah. and it was, it was a nationwide group of people who would come together and train for a couple of months. And then, um, and they taught us basically all the basics of the industry. And they didn't teach us how to act. Like, how, how they didn't make us good actors. They didn't make it. They just took you mm -hmm. on the talent that you already had and then taught you, you know, don't shake it, um, an agent, a manager's hand or don't, don't, don't shake a casting director's hand when you walk into the room because right. maybe they're germaphobes or, and they're seeing 100 people every day. Right. Something that you don't think about, but yeah. it's like you should know these Those skills. Things. Yeah. Exactly. So the practical skills that you need for, That's cool. for, for success in the industry. And then, uh, uh, and I had the, I was, I had the opportunity to do it twice actually, um, which was uh, quite a blessing to have. Um, but, uh, I, so we had the, this big showcase at the end mm -hmm. where different, uh, agents and managers and, um, VIPs of the industry would come down and watch all these performers do their different events, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so through that, I, uh, got a call back from, from my agent. I was with Lily's talent agency and, um, started working with them and they, they signed me and I started they would send me out on jobs in Chicago. How old, how old are you at this point? I think I was probably 14. I turned wow. 14 during this process. Yeah. Um, and so, so you're learning a lot of really practical, real life things and skills. And you, did you realize what all of that was at that point? Did you realize like how important all of those little nuances were? I would say no. And that's why I'm, I did end up doing it again. And I'm very thankful that I did. Um, I did it again before I moved out to California because I figured, you know, again, I'm going to be, everything's going to be changing up. I need to have as many contacts as possible. You knew at that point you wanted to move to LA? Yes. Yeah. At that point we knew that that was the decision that was happening. Um, at 14. No, 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 no. The second oh. time I did it. The I'm sorry. How yeah. old were you? The a 17, I think. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and so, um, but the first time I, like I gathered, I got that information, I clocked it and I, I had it, you know, locked away in there. Yeah. So I'm not shaking hands with the wrong people and all that, right. but I didn't really realize all, all the extent of what, what was going to go into it yet until I started going out and doing auditions and, and spending money on classes and headshots and all that, which are expensive. And one of the big things I started to realize then, and I'm realizing even now, more now that I'm, I'm starting to support myself instead of having my parents pay for my headshots and classics and all that. Yeah. It's acting and anything in the industry is a front end investment. If you're making music, you're paying hundreds of dollars for microphones and computers and equipment and software to make that music, and then you're going you're gonna to start making money. Does it have money. to be? Well, I would imagine so. I mean, you, yes, you can make music with cheaper microphones but, uh, and all of that, but you can't, there's, there's no way to make, to, to make, to put a song on Spotify without having a microphone. You know, without mm -hmm. having so, and and it doesn't have to be a huge investment. It doesn't have to, to be right to have a have a have a positive ROI. Is what you're saying? Right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I wasn't sure if you were talking about the the process itself. You had to spend money before you could start doing. That's no, not what you're saying. no, not before you start doing. Okay. I before you start that. earning. Gotcha. Um, like uh, in in acting, you 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 should you have to get you have to have headshots mm -hmm. before anybody's gonna see your headshot. You know, right. before anyone's gonna see who you are. And you have to spend money on that. Yeah. And you have to do that frequently. Yeah. But eventually, you're going to start making money back from that because people are seeing your headshot. And then right. Every, every, all of those little things are investments that 
are long-term investments. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You're making long-term investments. Yeah. And I, I started to learn that there, and I started to learn how much you really had to put into everything, and even just the nuances of, oh, my agent gets this much of my cut, and you know, I this much goes to taxes, and this is I how I how I keep contact with people that I've worked for before. Mm-hmm. I did a um, uh, a voiceover job for uh, Talkies commercial. And I was I was just having fun in in the voiceover room, just cracking people up. And by the end of the day, um, one of the one of the people there was like, you know, here, take my card, hold on to this. Let me know if there's ever anything you need, or and and text or email me so that we can keep in touch. Um, and Building relationships. Exactly, and that it's just as long as you're having fun and having a good time, and a, just a real person, people want to. People want to be around that. That's what sells in Hollywood and, and anywhere there's art is is a genuine person sells. Did you get free talkies? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sweet. I actually have a bag of talkies in my room at home in Chicago that's, that's, that's on the that wall. Shoot. That's from the, that shoot. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's so I cool. Have, well, a lot of... So I do that. I do that. That's something that I, I love to do. Put memorabilia on my walls. Yeah. You, even in our room, I have like a pair of the uh, chopsticks from the first night that, that we ate together as roommates. Um, oh, wow. Taped up on the wall, which That's is so cool. on the other side of the wall, so you can't see it, but it's right there. That's so cool. Yeah. Building relationships over building connections. Oh, yeah. Because, like, there's there's something that's kind of this idea of networking and... and networking is, is, is stupid. Don't network. Unless Just, you're doing it to build relations, gen- genuine right, relationships. Right, right. But don't... don't I, I, I would warn against going in, in with the mindset of, I'm going to make, I'm going to build my network. Yeah. Go in and try and get a new friend. That's, for me, it's, and I think that's helpful too for people who might be a little less confident, is it's scary to go in and be like, I have to get someone to give me their business card. Yeah. That's really scary as opposed to, um, I was invited to a, a, a agent or a manager's meeting um, for a, the man, the management company that manages called my friends, and if I had gone in with the mindset of, I'm gonna get a manager, then I it wouldn't nothing would have happened. And I didn't get a manager, obviously, but I got the business card of a couple of people just by talking and having a good time, and and I have those now that I can reach out to if I need to. It's much less nerve wracking when you flip it and go, how can I bring value to this person or these people rather than how can I go in and ask for something? Because yes. when you go in and you're asking, you're instantly putting yourself at a level of lower status and that affects you in, in how you feel. If you go into it as, I'm just going to be myself, I'm going to be genuine and I want to genuinely see what I can do, even if I don't have seemingly anything to offer, I want to see what I can do even if it's just make these people's, people have a better day. Go into it with that aspect, and then you're on your way to building genuine relationship rather than going in and being like, what you said, I'm going to get a manager or get something. And I'd say even more than just with building your network, I'd say with anything in life. Anything. Looking, going, going into it with the attitude of how can I make them better, how can I, how can I bring value to them as yeah. opposed to how can I pull value to myself yeah. is, gonna be, is go, going to make your life a whole lot easier, especially for me with, uh, again, with auditions. If I'm, one of the things that someone said to me is, if you're walking into the room being like, I hope that they, they like me and they'll cast me, that's going to ruin your, your perspective of self. Yeah. But if you're going Absolutely. in and realizing that they, that, I mean, obviously they need someone, they need someone to act for them. You, you're that person. They need you. That's yeah. a much better mindset and, and is going to make you more comfortable in the audition and yeah. in anything else in what, you're, in what you're doing. So I, again, I mentioned the group of friends that I had, um, in Chicago, in that time, um, pre and post the first time I did this program, we we just started making stuff together. We were fascinated with cameras, and there were we watched. I mean, I'm I'm all self taught. Nothing nothing I've I've done in the acting world or in in the cinema world is you know professionally trained. My acting, yes, I've had some professional training, but but um, and my cinematography and with my graphic design. It's all stuff that I've just been fascinated with, looked up on YouTube, and learned how to do. I, I grew up watching, I would binge the uh, Film Riot. I don't know if you know the I the love YouTube. Film Riot. Film Riot's amazing. Yes. For great filmmakers, uh, also Indie Mogul, all these yep, YouTube yep, channels yep. that would just, that talked about film because they loved it too. I, it, it was such a joy to me to yeah. sit down and learn how to do that. 
And so I would, you know, lie in bed until two in the morning, you know, watching, watching these videos and just soaking up this information. And a lot of it even ended up being, you know, how to use After Effects. And it was just them giving me, you know, coding information. And I still loved it so much that by the time I got After Effects, I knew how to use it because I had watched people use it for yeah. so long. Um, I knew, I know how to do cinematography because, well, I like movies and I know how I want things to look. So I think a lot of, a lot of filmmaking and a lot of art, I think there's great value to having it be self-taught. And so there was a group of friends that I had. We made a, uh, a Batman fan film, um, which I hope isn't on YouTube somewhere, but might be. <laughs> uh, when we were, um, it was probably during AMTC, during that time. Uh -huh. um, so we were going through puberty as we were making this. You can watch and you can see like our voices dropping and changing really? and we're getting way taller. It's amazing. Um, how, over how long of a span did you film it? Five, it took us five years to finish this thing. <laughs> we, it's 45 minutes long and um, I think it took us two and a half years to film and then uh, the director, um, Grant, um, edited, edited it himself over the next um, two and a half years. And it was, it was kind of our magnum opus. That was our great first work. And oh, it's awful. Oh, it's terrible. It really is just the worst. But it was a great starting point for us. We, mm. we started making short films and projects that we just wanted to make together after that. And that was the starting point. After that, you know, we upgraded everything. You know, we're like, okay, this is the camera we need. This is the audio equipment we need. This is the editing software we need. Because we edited that. We filmed it on a camcorder. We used yeah. a, a, a cardioid handheld microphone yeah. for singing to record everything. Yeah. Uh, we edited it on, um, I didn't, he did on uh, Windows Movie Maker. Like it, I remember those <laughs> we days. all remember those days. But um, that's to say that no one needs to start from somewhere great. I think it's better to start from somewhere bad. Absolutely. And so you can learn what a blessing it is now to have, you know, the, the equipment that we have, the camera that I've, I've, I've wanted all my life. I, I realize I now have the equipment that I've wanted all of my life. Yeah. Um, and that brings so much more value to the art that I create. And it also didn't take you that long. It didn't. I'm Some only people, 19. I'm, yeah. I'm not yet 20. Yeah. And I have, I have, I own people's dreams. I own what yeah. people have dreamed to, to be able to It's use. exciting and it's humbling. Like, even just this setup, like, it's, uh, yeah, because I used to love making video. I wanted to make, you know, all my own music videos and... And I wanted to do like podcast type things and interviews and and to have you know this camera, this microphone. And now this we're software. turning through four K footage and yeah, exactly. And, but all of it started with an investment on the front end. Yeah, and then yeah. it's just it's paid off. Yeah, um, but that that's to say to anyone you know that's my advice to anyone who is looking for you know how to get into the industry. Just start doing Just stuff. Start Just start doing, doing stuff. Because yes. and that's how you learn. And that's what's so exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're doing. Put yourself in vulnerable, strategic positions mm. to fail. Yeah. And be willing to take the L and learn from it in every possible way without overjudging yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, you can... It's, it's easy. It's easy to overjudge yourself. And it's also easy to overestimate yourself. Um, I have a plug, um, for my movie that just came out, woot woot, um, <laughs> it's, just, it's on Amazon Prime, uh, it's called Don't Run, and, uh, it's we actually, actually really good. we sat down and watched it together, it's a lot of fun, but it's also, it's corny, it's real corny, and oh, yeah. I remember, um, it's a, it's a corny horror movie, oh yeah, but it's tons of fun, um, so much fun, and, uh, I, I had actually booked, a, um, a feature film prior to that, um, and I made a YouTube video about, hey, I just booked a feature film, let's learn together, and then, like, a month later, we got the notification, they're like, and we lost funding, it's canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I was like, oh, darn, I booked another feature film, and they're like, cool. Um, How old are you at this point? Probably 14, I think this was just after AMTC, the second one, um, uh, like, okay, great, we're gonna film it. It was a really cool concept. Oh, I love, I actually am hoping to reach out to the director at some point, um, the, and, and ask if I can, if I can remake it, because I love the idea. It's called, it's called Dream Machine, and I really want to reach out to the director if someday you're listening to this. I hope I've already reached out to you and asked you if I could remake it, um, or make it. 
Um, cause I love the idea. The concept was of a kid who goes into his, his dreams, um, who creates a machine and he's like in high school to go into his dreams. And, um, so he can talk to his mom who's, who's passed away. Mm. Um, and it's him building, you know, learning, learning how to, uh, trust his friends and, um, build relationships with people that he, uh, that he doesn't know very well and how to, how to open up to people. And it's a really great story. Wow. Um, booked that one. And then we got the notification, the lost funding. We yeah. got it. We're not doing it. Um, how do you respond in those situations? Oh, it's awful. It's how do you deal with that disappointment with the, I don't know if you put any prep into it. Like, how do you deal with that? It's, it's tough. I mean, the first, the very first project that was canceled on me uh, was Lord of the Flies. Um, was a was a film adaptation of Lord of the Flies, and I read through the book and started to annotate it. Like I bought myself the book and was annotating it as I was going, and I was digging into it, and I was putting hours of my the rest of my life aside to pour into this. And then we got the notification saying that it was canceled, and it it was devastating for a second because I so much of myself wanted to do this, and I and I'm not I'm I'm not hopefully any more foolish enough to say that I was so in character that it was that or anything like that yeah. but I but my my pride in wanting to be the lead in, in a film and and wanting to um wanting to make a movie really hit me hard um but I think the thing that you need to focus on um is that there's going to be more there's always going to be more art and if someone else isn't going to create it for you you can create it. That creativity is inside of you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be interested in pursuing that. Yeah. Um, so knowing that just because someone else wasn't able to follow through on their creativity doesn't mean that you're not able to follow through on your own. Um, but it is, I mean, honestly, there is no magic. I don't think there is any kind of magic cure to, oh, well, that's gone now. Yeah. Um, Cause again, I th I, but that that was my response with the, with Dream Machine. It's like, well, that is gone. Wow. But I still want to. I'm still gonna do it someday. I am. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Um. And also, um, from the second uh, from Dream Machine, when when that was canceled, I was like, ah, great. Well, and I printed out that email and put it on my wall as motivation to keep working. And um, about a year later, I got an email from um, the assistant director um and he said hey i'm working on a short film and i would really like you to audition for it wow and i auditioned for it and i got the part and we filmed a short film that's gonna be coming out called asana um hopefully coming out this next year um so just cool. from from the contact i from never I, I i think i talked with him in person once like or not in person uh, over skype because they, they were in um uh, virginia Mm -hmm. And so I, I never even met the people, yeah. but a year later I get an email. Hey, we, we were part of dream machine. We'd like you to audition for this. Another six months later, I'm, I've flown out to Virginia and I'm staying with the director filming a short film and that, that stuff happens all the time. Gotta be persistent. Yeah. Sometimes it gets really far. Uh, there's on my IMDB, I'm still credited for a show called gone. Um, or I was one of the leads for it. Um, all, I have a whole bunch of YouTube videos about the casting process for that, and we flew to Virginia and filmed it once, and they cut it together, and they gave us footage for our reel, and they're like, wait a second, this isn't good enough, we want to redo it. So they flew us out to Virginia again, and filmed it all again with a bigger cast and more people, and then they flew us home. Nothing's, I've, I've seen none of it. Wow. N none of it's been anywhere, and this has been several years. Yeah. It could still be happening, maybe, but we've heard nothing from the directors. We've seen nothing of it. My guess is it's dead in the water, but I'm still credited for it, and I still did it. So, so always be cautious of of how of of the certainty of of mm. your project, because and I'm still glad to have done that. There's so much I learned from that. Because you love the process. I love the process. It was fun. The people that I met are amazing. I actually had one of the... Uh, uh, Showtime Brando is the guy's name. Um, Brandon was one of the cast members. And he he came out and was... he's Oh my gosh, I, I'm so inspired by his passion. He flew out to California about a year ago, just after I had moved here, um, to talk to Marvel about uh, starting a live-action Miles Morales um, 
Spider-Man movie and wanting to be the lead. And he, he, I don't know who he talked to. I don't know how it happened. He talked to someone about it and they're like, that's a great idea. I don't know, I, I don't know how much further that's gone, but yeah. he, came, he, he called me up and was like, hey, I'm coming to California. Can I crash on your couch for a day? I'm like, I don't even have a couch, but you can lie, you can sleep on the floor if you want to. He's like, cool, I'll sleep on the floor. And so he spent a week with me in my old apartment in, in California just because of a project that we done together. That's cool. So networking comes, uh, that's the other good thing from projects that don't come to fruition you're still networking. You're still making friends. As a byproduct of being a good, genuine person and doing your best work, you create a network. Yeah. And it's absolutely. a byproduct rather than a, I'm going to get this network. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a successful person? Are you successful? It's a really good question. Um, I successfully moved to California, <laughs> you know? And I successfully... Um, ended up being roommates with two incredibly talented people. Um, and I'm successfully learning how to be better. But I think it's really hard. It's really hard to determine what success is if you haven't set a goal for yourself. What is your goal for success? I, my, I think I will be a success. I will be successful. And I think there's a difference between being a success and being su successful. Um, What's the difference? I think being a success is being yourself. If you, putting your identity where it belongs, because your identity does not belong in your success, in how much money you have, in how many films you've done, in how many friends you have, in how many girlfriends you've had. Your success is not in your accomplishments. Your success is in who you are as a person. But I think I will have found success <laughs> Um, when I can sustain myself fully by being an artist, um, cause I'm working at Starbucks now. I, I was full time. I just recently started working part time at Starbucks. Um, and that's not what I want to be doing with my life, mm -hmm. but I think I will be successful when I, when I don't have to turn anywhere else for, you know, for money, for housing, for anything, um, and I, I'm doing what I love and, and supporting myself doing that. But also, that's not going to determine whether or not I'm happy. Are you happy? I am. I'm, I'm very happy. And that's not to say that there aren't times where I'm exhausted or really Is that tired. part of the happiness, though? Is the exhaustion, does that at all contribute to your happiness? Not when I'm exhausted, but the next day once I've, once I've gotten enough sleep and I'm like, wow, I worked really hard yesterday. Man, that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. um, and that perpetuates a desire to work hard. Exactly. And I am a Christian. I find my joy in Jesus Christ. But Let's... a big part of that joy is in the work that he provides for us to do. Yeah. Is in successfully finishing the work that's provided for us. Yeah, I mean, this, this show, the whole premise of this is like, some people don't know what their purpose is. Some people are looking for it their entire life. Some people, and the whole delusion aspect of it is because in, in my story, and uh, I imagine a lot of these guests as we continue to do it, their story too is going to be, people literally thought I was like crazy, like yeah. a little delusional. like. Oh yeah, there are people from my church at home who are concerned that I'm out here. Yeah. Who are, and, and, and... My, I'm not out here to you know, go nuts, go crazy, be a celebrity and, 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 and party all day. That's not what I'm here for. But it's still, I think it's hard for some people to imagine someone coming out here and being a normal person. You know, and that's why I respect, I respect a lot, of, like people like, like Kevin Hart seems like a real person to me. Yeah, and there's a lot of people, as I'm kind of slowly starting to pull back the curtain of this industry in, in a small way, in, in just the songwriting community, and there is a tremendous group of people in all of these little niches in this industry that are real people who are genuine, who are incredibly talented, incredibly kind people doing things for the right reason. And that's exciting because you look at Los Angeles, you look at Hollywood as a whole from an outside perspective and you see glamour and, and corrosion kind yeah. of in a weird, like those are the two extremes and somehow they all mix together. And I think it's cool that there are actually people who are really good people in this industry. 
And this is the next generation. The whole idea of this podcast is like, there is a next generation rising up, you know, over the next several decades that is going to be the future of for uh, the world, obviously, but like more specifically the entertainment industry. And my hope and my desire is that some of those people are going to be people who sat on this couch and talked on this podcast. Right. And that's exciting. And that's why I think a big part, I, I don't think to some extent what you, I think what you just said cancels the option of there being delusion because there, there is going to be a void. There is going to be a vacuum of creatives. It's not gonna be a huge vacuum, um, but Harrison Ford is gonna die. Um, uh, uh, Michael Fassbender and all these, all you, know, uh, um, uh, Matt Damon and um, who's who's the guy he's in the movie with right now? Uh, Ford versus Ferrari. What's his name? Oh, um, I don't know his name. Oh man, uh, Christian Bale. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna die or stop acting. Well, they are gonna die. Um, but there's there's going to be not that we want that. Yeah, Let's be that, clear. Would be, that would be a We're shame. We're not planning assassinations, <laughs> but. Um, Someone's gonna have to take their place, yeah. and it, there's more people who want to take their place than are going to take their place. But someone has to, and so if you're out here being delusional, even delusionally excited about creating art and uh, passionate about the right things, you're gonna go somewhere. You might not. You might not even get to your dreams if we're being entirely practical. But you will you will go somewhere because if you're willing to work for it, you're going to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and put in the time going through it and going through the literally eight years, nine years, ten years that you've already put into this and you're scaling that and imagine a decade from now where you're going to be with that consistent work ethic and that's, that's we've talked on in every episode previous to this is the time aspect. A lot of people mm. are willing to work hard. Not a lot of How people long? have the patience to endure. And that's where people go, oh, maybe I'm delusional. I'm also realizing how really serious and there's been no laughter in this podcast the entire way through. <laughs> and I feel bad about that. Why do you feel bad about it? Because sometimes it's hard to listen to people just being serious. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a joke. Uh, a detective is looking at three holes in the ground. Well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I love Danny, because I can always rely on him to just pull out a magic trick. Pull, you Okay, so uh, in that regard then, you acrobatic stuff. <laughs> no, gymnastics, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Gymnastic, well, which is, which is which acrobatic. Is acrobatic. Yeah. Um, it, martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, you you ta- taekwondo. Um, you, you magic tricks and... All sorts I, of stuff. I managed to keep myself under five five my entire life. I'd say that's that's an impressive that's trick. Pretty, yeah. That's pretty. That's yeah. pretty skill based. Yeah. <laughs> like seriously, you do so much, and you're a hilarious person. So <laughs> yeah. I'd like to think that our serious or lack of laughter is hopefully actually really encouraging and exciting and intriguing. And builds and intriguing. Yeah, and I'd like it to bring value to whoever happens to be listening to it. Mm. I'd really like to think that's the case. But also, if it's not. Let us know, and we'll have Danny back for a um, for a, no, a laughing. Know, we'll never based. have Danny back. No, let us know. We'll, we'll do a laughing based. We'll episode just do a comedy with Danny. episode. He he can tell you lots of jokes <laughs> that just waste your time. Yeah. Blue blue velvet. What is it? Purple velvet. Purple velvet. Oh oh, those of you who know purple velvet are blessed. <laughs> no, no, not. It's terrible. Um, uh, I did want to actually, though, address... You did uh, ask a question about how I got um, my agent manager, and, and my answer was through AMTC. Yes. Um, but that's one of the big questions that uh, a lot of actors, I think, uh, have. And it's a tough one. Um, but basically, what I've been told to do to, to if I want to move up the chain of, of whoever I'm, I'm working with, get their contact information. A lot of it is available online. Um just get get the office the office contact information and email them your headshot and resume and say hey i've been i've you probably shouldn't say much so it's nice and quick cuz right. they're busy but you can say hey i'm this person i've been doing this and i would be interested in working with you here's my headshot my resume a link to my imdb Boom. and a reel 
send it off to them and and don't just oh don't just mass email because that's email email to people that you want to work with and have you yeah you've done your research yeah do your research you have a target because because just 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 spamming people is never going to make them it's never a good idea yeah um but that if that's a question for you there's there's the answer there's always something you can do there's always an action you can take even if it's not the most glamorous even if you don't have the nicest equipment creatively pursue those creative efforts and also on the business side, especially now, let's talk about changing landscapes a little bit. Mm. The landscape has changed so much that you, as the actor, as the creative, have so much control. You can take control of distribution. You can take control of reaching out to people. You don't need to have a manager to go directly to a casting director. Like all of these things, there's always something to do. You can do on the creative side and on the business side. You do have the option to submit yourself to auditions and to make videos on YouTube, to put, uh, I, uh, there's a short film that I made. Holy cow, I just stuttered like crazy. A short film that I made with Reed Miller that's on Amazon Prime, and it's just on Amazon Prime now. So cool. How did you guys, let's talk about the, the tactics of that a little. I wish I had any part in putting it on there. Okay. I, I know nothing about it, but um, okay. you have songs that thousands of people have listened to on, on Spotify. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. It's crazy. People, there's no way you could have done that. 20 years ago right. because Spotify, but you know, yeah. but also <laughs> you couldn't, there's, there's, it would have been a lot harder for you to have created your own audience in the way that you have. And now it's so, so much more readily available, which I'm careful not to say easier right. because it is more readily available. Everyone Everybody can do access. it. So it's hard to make yourself stand out, mm-hmm. but everyone has access to. So if you are a quality artist and you're, you're smart about how you go about things, like you are. I see you all the time. You're so business-minded, and it really impresses me how business-minded you are and, and how wise you are in sharing your artwork. Um, if you're willing to do your research, learn how to do it well, and then do it well, and share it well, yeah. it's findable. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's so cool. It's so exciting. Also makes you think very carefully about, like even for me, um, when you should or should not get an agent or manager um, because they take part of your paycheck for every project that you do. Yeah. And uh, when you should or should not join the actors union or you know the yeah. actors guild um, because that's a big investment and then you can't do projects that are non-union. Right. Um, You're not union yet, right? I'm, I'm eligible, but I haven't joined because yeah. I know that I'm going to be, I can still book more projects if I'm yeah. not doing, which, and that's where it becomes Quality over quantity. Um, if you're if you have two credits on your resume, don't join the union yet. Do student films. Do short films. I had, uh, I did a short film that I wasn't paid for. Um, mm-hmm. That I did because I enjoyed doing it, and I won a best actor award. And um, Darren Aronofsky's editor ended up seeing the short film. And was like, I want to help work on this. Um, so Darren Aronofsky's editor has seen my face. I'm just going to say, that's pretty cool. Um, but great things come from unpaid projects. Marvelous oh, yeah. things comes from, come from unpaid projects. Um, and that was another credit on my resume. And so the more, the more you have, regardless of quality, makes you look better. And, but you do want to be obviously finding quality yes. stuff. And also quality, to this note, in a lot of ways is subjective. Yeah. Of course, there are technical qualifications that, you know, 4K is obviously better than just full HD or 720, whatever, like all of those technically. But as far as quality art, when we're talking about art, subjective, subjective. So, um, I say use, use what you have at your disposal to build your, um, build your, your background, build your knowledge and learn from that. Because even being on, on, uh, the set of Knuckleball, the unpaid project, it, it, we, I still learned so much about mm. set lingo, how to interact with the peop- yeah. with people correctly, how to get into character and, and be properly on top of things there. And check your ego. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing is below you. There, my, my old director in high school, Jim Raposa, would always say there's always somebody below you who wants your place. Mm. And as soon as you are just a little too egotistical, as soon as you slip up, Someone is going to be more humble, more hard of a worker, you know, on time, 
and is going to take your place because there's there's people below you who want that. And again, that applies to everything in life. Absolutely. Um, it frustrates me when I see when I have friends who who are like I'm not going to take this role. It's I, I I'm not I'm not a TV actor. I'm not a sitcom actor. That's a stupid audition. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> the audition so for much. it? Yeah, you learn so much and. Um, what was it? I think Harrison Ford got, um, uh, not Luke Skywalker. He plays, <laughs> um, he plays Han Solo. Uh, but he got the role of Han Solo because, uh, he had worked, he had worked for, uh, George Lucas before as like a carpenter or something. And he was oh. on set. And so he was on set of Star Wars as, uh, not as an actor, but as a, like a, set a set builder, I think. That's so cool. I didn't know that. And the actor who was playing Harrison Ford, who, who was Han playing uh, Han Solo, started showing up late and drunk and was not behaving well. And so ev- eventually, uh, George Lucas was like, get out of here. Uh, Harrison, you, you act, right? Can you read some of his lines? And th- the rest is history. From what I understand. Now, now look up, research that story on your own, because right. I don't know. but that happens. Yeah, but that kind of stuff does happen. What does the future look like for Danny Arizari? The, the next year, two, three, five, and, you know, ultimately, what is your dream? My dream is to be able to make whatever film I want to make. Um, and I don't know if that's in front of or behind the camera, but my dream would be to be part of to to be a owner and and or co-owner of a production company that allows us to do to make the art that I want to create um over the next couple of years uh future is always uncertain but I have in the works I am writing a short film that I'm hoping to film within the next year but I said that last year so yeah. it might be in the next 5 years who knows um and also, something that we've talked about is how a lot of artists are desperate to get their stuff out now. Now, 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 now. Mm. And something that I thought about recently that's that's exciting to me is that I don't have to get my stuff out now. I mean, I would love to have my short film already done in, in festivals, mm. but if it's not already done in, in festivals, I have that much time to keep writing, keep editing keep doing pre-production, keep getting on top of it, and keep making it better for the a, an unforeseeable amount of time until yeah. until it's... It's never going to be perfect. But uh, just keep taking time to um, make it as perfect as it's going to be. And then when the time comes around that I do have the time, money, and people to make it, I'm going to make it. Yeah. Um, so go check out uh, Clay uh, at Clay Movie on Instagram because you can get some previews of what I'm working on. Facts. Um, but that's coming out. I've, I'm um, we're almost done editing uh, Legacy, which is a short film I did with Reed Mill- or uh, 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 it was originally uh, the first episode of a series, and now we're going for a micro feature. Um, but it's it's a, a pretty big budget project considering our background. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, oh my gosh, it's an action adventure drama that's really, really, really well written. Really cool. And it's super exciting. But my hope is to be doing, making projects, skits, sketches, yeah. uh, films, music videos with you and with Eric. And, and that's the thing that we're so lucky about that, um, I'm so excited we get to talk about first because you have so much talent as, as a, as a composer and as, as a musician, you, you know that and as a businessman, you're so good at what you do and so good at researching what you do to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Eric is so, he's hysterical. He's so talented, so passionate, um, and so, so good at what he does. He's a great actor, musician, and has a lot of skill that I would say a, a lot of it is un- tapped yet totally undiscovered um and so a lot of it is there to be um for him to discover for himself and for us to kind of poke and prod and you know squeeze until it until that talent just spews out and so i'm excited to be working with you guys because we have a production team between the three of us the team is is solid exactly it's exciting and and there are more people in our lives that i'm excited to be working with I don't have any specifics on what that future looks like, but um, I'm hoping by the end of the year to have quit my day job um, and be renting out my the camera equipment that I have and um, be doing freelance work 
doing more freelance work and starting different businesses to support myself with the equipment that I already have, mm -hmm. um, that we already have, and just start creating my work, my own work and our own work in the industry that we want to be working in. And the best way to do that is kind of just to start doing that. Uh, I think Steve Harvey um, has this famous quote of, you got to jump. No one's been successful without taking risk. It's like with, it's like, you can't use a parachute unless you jump out of an airplane. Yeah. And if you use your parachute inside the airplane, it's just going to get tangled, dude. Oh yeah, that's going to be a big problem. <laughs> and you're also reinvesting your investment. Like you talked about your initial upfront investment, and now you're taking that investment and reinvesting it by renting out your stuff. Yeah. One thing I did want to say too is something yeah. that I've recently really found helpful is um, creativity walks, mm. um, sure. which is just sometimes, sometimes if you have any time at all, leave your phone at home, you know, grab, grab your apartment keys and that's it. And just walk around, um, especially at night for me, mm. it's just walking around and experiencing nothing you know all all of everything and 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 just nothing specific at once yeah. soaking that in and letting letting your creativity flow um just in your head not even trying to think about anything particular just walking and letting creativity come to you has been really really therapeutic um it's just it's kind of this time of meditation Practiced boredom. Exactly. It's restful to me. Yeah. And I think for some people, walking around might not be restful. Find, find your restful thing. Yeah. Um, but for me, taking that time to allow creativity to fill an empty space is insightful and restoring. Um, and something that we often forget to do because the world is so fast paced and even just talking about that like thinking thinking about walking around you can see i'm talking slower already and i'm and i'm like i feel peaceful and it's just it's nice to have something that makes you feel at peace um and that's something that i wish someone had told me mm. thank you for being on bro yeah, this was so thank good. You. I love we'll it. We'll definitely be back, probably season two. We're probably gonna do an episode with Eric, Danny, and I. Yes. We'll have the whole I'm team so on. Excited. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you, bro. I appreciate your time. You're a beast, man. Yeah, man. So are you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Purpose or Delusion. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes, and also be sure to check out the previous episodes you may have missed. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week.